Hey, good morning. Good to see you all on this beautiful snowy day. I hope you like the snow. I absolutely love it. So uh, I'm happy today, and that's saying a lot for a melancholy person, but uh, super happy about the snow today. Hey, uh, as you know, we have Thanksgiving coming up, uh, not this week, but the following week, but we have the day before Thanksgiving. Anybody know what the day before Thanksgiving is? Uh, Well, it's the day before Thanksgiving, but yes, we also have one thing. One thing, this is our monthly third Wednesday of every month, our praise and prayer gathering. We want to gather together to give thankful praise to our God for all that he has done. And what a wonderful time, a strategic time for the body to be together. Uh, The day before Thanksgiving. A little different this time, what we're going to do is rather than having a meal on the front end from 5.30 to 6.30, we're actually going to start at 6 And at 6 o'clock, from 6 to 6.30, we're going to have dessert together. And uh, for those of you like me who do not like pumpkin pie, it's going to be perfect. We're not going to have pumpkin pie. We're going to have a choice of some other type of dessert. So you can have pumpkin pie on Thanksgiving Day. We're not going to ruin that for you. But we're going to have dessert from 6 to 6.30. And then we're going to gather for just about an hour. We're going to keep this one to about an hour because we know you have a lot of things happening and a lot of preparation, but we want to continue seeking the face of God, experiencing our God, and being built into a house of prayer. And like I've said before, this is the most important meeting of the month. Uh, I mean that, so put it on your calendar, uh, plan on being there, it's going to be a special time together. Well, for five weeks now, we've been looking at this ancient book, uh, the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk ministered during the final dark days of the kingdom of Judah. These were difficult days, uh, depressing days for the people of God. The people of God are mired in sin, and the war machine of Babylon is growing in power, increasing in strength, and Babylon is devouring everything in their path. And the book of Habakkuk gives us an interior view into one man's struggle to believe in the goodness of God. He takes a look at what's happening all around him. He sees tragedy, he sees evil in the world, and he's crying out to God, God, why don't you do something? And he's he's struggling. And this is what makes this ancient book so profoundly relevant, so profoundly modern in its message, because this is the question modern people ask. Uh, This is the question some of us ask. If God is all-powerful, if he's all-loving, and if he can do all things, and he can do it easily, then why doesn't he do something about the suffering and the injustice that fills our world? Uh, Habakkuk looks all around him in his day, and what does he see? He sees that the law of God is being neglected, that injustice and violence and bloodshed is filling the land, and there's a corrupt leadership that tolerates it all. So he cries out to God, God, why don't you do something? And God actually answers and responds to him and breaks the silence and says, I am doing something. I'm doing something. I'm sending, I'm bringing Babylon to judge Judah for their sins. And friends, this was not the answer Habakkuk was expecting. It was not the answer that he was wanting. God promises to do something, but the something that God promises to do will actually make matters worse in the short term. And so Habakkuk, when he receives that answer that I am doing something, I'm sending Babylon, Habakkuk says, what? What? Babylon? Judge us? How can you use a nation less righteous than us to judge us? Hey, I understand that we have our problems, but God, they're far worse than we are. How how can you send them to judge? I, I, I don't get it. Babylon shouldn't be judging us. We should be judging Babylon. And so Habakkuk is confused, and that's really his second question. Uh, how can you use Babylon? They're worse than we are. And so Habakkuk waits for God to answer his second complaint. And God eventually does answer. He says, yes, I'm going to send Babylon to judge my people. You heard correctly, but believe me, Babylon is going to get theirs. I'm going to judge Babylon. I'm going to bring Babylon down. And he says, woe to them. 
What unimaginable sorrow awaits them. Though Judah, their judgment, and Babylon's downfall seems like it will never happen, believe me, it will. And God says, a day is coming when all the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. And even though you don't see it yet, the just shall live by faith in this future that I've promised. You need to trust me. And that's the theme of the entire book, that the just shall live by faith, even if we can't see it now. So God promises that Babylon will judge Judah. And eventually, Babylon is going to be judged by another nation. Uh, we got this cycle that's taking place in the book of Habakkuk. Why? Because given enough time, most nations will eventually become like Babylon. Because of our fallenness, because of our depravity, you give it enough time, and most nations, most governments will move in a direction of becoming like Babylon. Uh, it's the sad history of human empires trying to live without God. And this raises a key question about human history. Will God allow this cycle to continue forever with one nation destroying another, one Babylon-like nation imposing their violence and destruction on other nations? Will there be no end to the corruption, to the bloodshed, uh, to the violence? This is the question of Habakkuk chapter 3. When will the cycle end? And this is the big question that Habakkuk brings to God in prayer. Uh, Look with me at chapter 3, Habakkuk chapter 3, at the very beginning it says, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. According to Shiganoth, now that's a strange term, Uh, most scholars believe it's a liturgical term of some type. If you look at the very last verse of chapter 3, sections of Habakkuk 3 were meant to be put to music. So this is likely a music term. And Habakkuk says, O Lord, I have heard the report of you, and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of your years, revive it. In the midst of your years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. So Habakkuk sees this endless cycle of violence and destruction at the hands of Babylon-like nations, and he asks the same thing that we should ask in prayer to God. God, would you act in the present the way you have in the past? As we look at the world all around us, we should plead with God to repeat his mighty acts of salvation in history. Uh, The peace that we desire and long for in our world is not going to come about because of who occupies 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. It's not gonna come about because one political party over another has power in Congress. It's not gonna happen by way of United Nations resolution. Our only hope is that a prince of peace will rescue our world out of this endless cycle of sin and destruction. Do you see what Habakkuk says? He says, I have heard the report of you And your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. Habakkuk is saying, what you've done before, God, would you do it again? Now, Habakkuk has not personally witnessed God's mighty acts of salvation in the past, but he says he stands in awe of them. Well, what specifically is Habakkuk talking about? Uh, This salvation of the Lord. Habakkuk is specifically thinking of God defeating evil, bringing justice, and rescuing the oppressed when he saved the people of Israel out of Egypt. He's thinking about God's mighty acts of salvation through Exodus, through bringing them out, bringing them into a land of their own. He looks back at God's mighty work of salvation at the time of the Exodus, and he says, what you did for us back then, God, would you do it again? Revive your work. Save us from this corruption and violence and bloodshed. Now, friends, this is a biblical prayer. It's an honest prayer. It's a desperate prayer. It's the type of prayer that God is pleased to answer. And I think Habakkuk understands the gravity and the weight of the situation, of what he's asking God to do. Because he says what? He says, in wrath, remember mercy. 
Lord, I know that hard times are coming, and I accept that, but Lord, if hard times must come, if Babylon is going to come and judge us, don't allow them to wipe us out. Remember mercy, God, or we will perish. And I wonder, as we take a look at our world around us today, do we feel Habakkuk's sense of grief over sin and the destruction that we see in our world? Uh, Do we share his desperation for God to intervene in a dramatic way? If the answer is yes, if we can nod our heads in the affirmative and say yes, we share some of Habakkuk's heart, then that has to issue forth in our prayers. It has to be expressed in prayer, and that's one of the things that we'll express at our one thing two Wednesdays from now. It was back in 2014 that Ann Graham Lotz, the daughter of Billy Graham, uh, she called on America to spend seven days in fervent prayer for our nation. In her call to prayer, she said, one of the things God has impressed on me is that we are living at the end of human history as we know it. In light of this, he has given me some practical assignments. One was to be the honorary chair of the National Day of Prayer. He gave me a message I was to deliver, which was from Joel chapter 1, the day of the Lord is at hand. It was a message warning that judgment is coming. This is all about calling God's people together to pray before it's too late and judgment falls on our nation. Now, friends, I agree. And I I think many of you agree, America is in trouble. The nations on the face of the earth are in trouble. Evil is running rampant in our world. There's no doubt about it, but the question is, do we feel the weight of this? Or are we just living these insular lives in the safe domain, the safe bubble of this suburbia that we live in? Do we feel the weight of it? If we do, it must issue forth in prayer. I'm saying, God, you've you've done it before. Would you do something again? You see, that's Habakkuk's prayer. God, you've saved us before. Would you save us again? And God answers Habakkuk's prayer in response to Habakkuk's prayer for God to put an end to this evil cycle of destruction in the world. God gives Habakkuk a terrifying vision of what he's done in the past. A terrifying vision of what he has done to Egypt, of what he will do to Babylon, and what he will do ultimately to all nations that stand in his way. As God decisively intervened to save his people out of Egypt through the Exodus, so he will intervene, get this, to bring about a new Exodus, a greater Exodus, a greater story of salvation to bring a defeat to evil, to bring justice to all and rescue the oppressed. He has done it in the past and he will do it in the future again. God will save a faithful remnant of his people. Babylon will not have the last word. And you understand that Babylon in this context is more than just the nation of Babylon, that Babylon is emblematic. It's an emblem of all the evil and all that's wrong with our world. Uh, This future deliverance is described for us beginning in verse 3 of this vision that God gives Habakkuk of him doing like he did at the time of the Exodus, but on a much grander scale. So Habakkuk gets this vision, and what does he see? Look at verse 3. God came from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hands, and there he veiled his power. Before him went pestilence, and plague followed at his heels. When God comes to judge, it is going to be a physical display of grandeur and glory unlike anything that we have ever seen. His glory will light up the earth There's going to be peals of thunder and lightning radiating from his powerful presence. Pestilence will go before him. Plague will follow, deadly plague at his heels, overtaking and destroying his enemies all around. He stood, verse 6, and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. 
I saw the tents of Cushion. This is modern day Ethiopia. I saw the tents of Cushion in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. When God comes to judge, the entire cosmos will respond in fear. Even the mighty mountains will quake and tremble in his presence. Uh, the nations like Cush and Midian that lie in the path of his war march will be terrified by what they see. Was your wrath, verse 8, against the rivers? Oh Lord, this is going back to the time of the Exodus, the imagery here of the parting of the Red Sea. Was your anger against the rivers? Or your indignation against the sea when you rode on your horses on your chariot of salvation. When God comes to judge, to judge Babylon and to judge the Babylon-like nations, what's his mentality? What's his mindset? What's his emotional state of mind? Three different words in this verse tell us. Do you see them? Wrath, anger, and indignation. God is righteously angry at the Babylon-like nations that have destroyed this world. And as a victorious warrior, the Lord leads his chariot into battle, and we're told that every single arrow finds its mark. You stripped, verse 9, the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and withered. The raging waters swept on, and the deep gave forth its voice that lifted its hands on high. The sun and the moon stood still in their place, and the light of your arrows as they sped, and the flash of your glittering spear. When God comes to judge, his presence is accompanied by supernatural and natural phenomenon, torrential downpours, flash floods, storm surges, thunder and lightning, plague and pestilence as he goes on his war march. The raging waters even lift up their arms begging for mercy. The sun and the moon stand still. They respond in paralyzing fear as in the days of Joshua, the sun and the moon stand still as the creator delivers his people and annihilates his enemies. Look at verse 12. You march through the earth in fury. You thresh the nations in your anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked. He did it to Pharaoh. He's going to do it to Babylon. He's going to do it to all the nations that oppose him on the face of the earth. Laying him bare from thigh to neck. Speaking of a wound from a sword. And then it says what? It says Selah. You know what that means? It says pause. Now think about that. Reflect on it. Uh, Take that in. You pierced, verse 14, with his own arrows, the head of his warriors, who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters. You see, this is a picture of when God comes to judge, he is righteously angry with all of his enemies, the enemies of his people. Just look at the verbs. You went out, you crushed, you laid bare, you pierced, you trampled. See, it's not very popular to talk about, but the truth is his white hot fury will burn against all the nations and governments and movements who have shed the blood of those who call on the name of Jesus. His white hot fury will burn against all the secular nations who have edged God out, who have edged Jesus out of every arena of life and said, we don't need God, we can live without God. His white hot fury burns against those who claim the name of Jesus but defame him by the way they live. And he will save a faithful remnant of his people from every nation 
on the face of the earth. He will save individuals, but he will rule over the nations with a rod of iron. And he will save his anointed. Look carefully at verse 13. This is Jesus in the book of Habakkuk. Okay, in verse 13, it's speaking of Jesus. Most likely a reference to the coming king from the line of David, the Lord Jesus Christ. And friends, this is a complete and decisive and final victory. What God did to Egypt in the past, he will do again to Babylon, and he will do again to the nations on the face of the earth that oppose him. I mean, this is a heavy message. And one point should be obvious for all to see, the complete and total defeat of all those who oppose God. Friends, we live in a day of grace. Uh, We live in an age of grace. Where God is patient, he's allowing plenty of time of mercy for people to respond to the message of salvation. Uh, The Lord Jesus right now, where is he? He's seated at the right hand of God the Father, the Almighty, the Majesty on high. The Lord Jesus is seated. His work for now is finished, but he's not going to remain seated forever. A day is going to come when the Son of God is going to stand, he's going to put on his robe, and the armies of heaven will decisively intervene in human history to bring about what has happened. What's described here? If, if, if you doubt it, it happened in Egypt, it happened in Babylon, it's going to happen exactly the way he says it's going to happen. But here's the deal, while we wait, we have an assignment We have an assignment to take the victory of Jesus, the good news about Jesus, the good news about grace and mercy and forgiveness that is freely available to all. And our calling is to spread that and to share the victory with as many people as we know, with our friends, with our loved ones, with our neighbors, and with our co-workers. We are the ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ought to actively be engaged in this mission. And I ask you, are you engaged? When is the last time you shared with somebody where you verbalized the words and you talked about the victory of Jesus and how that victory is available as a way of salvation for everyone? There's good news in the book of Habakkuk. The good news is this, that the Exodus story of the past has become a picture of a future Exodus, of a greater Exodus that God will perform for his people. Once and for all, he's going to bring down all of the Babylons. He's going to bring down all of the pharaohs of this world. He's going to bring justice and reconciliation and peace and righteousness and salvation to our world. As he says in verse 13, he's going to crush the head of the house of the wicked. One day, the same angels that announced joyfully the birth of Christ are also going to announce joyfully, fallen, fallen, Babylon is fallen where everything that's wrong with this world is going to be dealt with. And this is really great news in the long run. In the long run. But now Habakkuk has to wait for these terrible events to play out. And get this, Habakkuk most likely did not live long enough to see all of these things take place. Uh, Habakkuk lived long enough, I believe, to see the invasion of Babylon into Judah. He saw that, but he did not live long enough to see Babylon judge because Babylon did not fall for another 70 years. So just like you, just like me, Habakkuk had to live in faith, trusting in, believing in the promises of God, even though they did not happen in his lifetime. And when Habakkuk hears God's plan. How does he respond? Look at verse 16. He says, I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound and rottenness enters my bones. My legs trembled beneath me. Now now this phrase here, my body trembles, is a sanitized version because literally a more literal translation would be something like this, my guts twisted. When I saw this vision, my guts within me twisted. Uh, To put it in modern terms, we would call it probably something like a panic attack. Uh, he, he, He melts when he hears of God's plan to judge his covenant people and God's plan 
to judge Babylon. Friends, sometimes God's plan makes things worse in the short run. It's easy to trust God when life is good. But it's hard to trust God when that child walks away from the Lord. When a grandchild walks away from the Lord. Uh, When the dreaded diagnosis comes. It is hard to trust God when you're standing next to a casket of someone you love. But friends, Habakkuk shows us that because of God's promises, because of what he did in Egypt, because of what he did in Babylon, it's possible to dwell on a scorched earth with joy. Because of all of God's promises, it's possible to dwell on a scorched earth with, get this, paradoxically, uh, joy. Yes, Habakkuk is facing a terrifying future, but somehow he's able to say in the middle of of all of it. Look at verse 16 in the middle. Yet, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invade us. And though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stall, yet... Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. Have you ever seen a deer run alongside a cliff? Very steady feet. He makes me tread on my high places. Uh, These verses are beautiful verses that tell us that trust and joy are possible even when the earth is scorched. Severe things are going to happen when Babylon shows up to judge. Look again at that list in verse 17. Uh, Figs were a delicacy, like a piece of cheesecake. From the cheesecake factory, whatever your favorite cheesecake is, think about that. If the figs did not blossom, if you couldn't have cheesecake, yeah, you would miss it, but it's not the end of the world. Okay, you're going to be okay. Uh, Grapes were primarily used for wine, but you could live without wine. But olive oil is starting to get a little bit more serious with olives and olive oil. Olive oil was used for baking. Uh, Olive oil was used for lighting lamps. This is a major inconvenience, even privation. But then notice what happens. Look at the fields. The fields no longer produce wheat. They no longer produce barley. This is genuine suffering. Uh, even starvation. Sheep were used for wool and occasionally food. They were part of the economy. Uh, Cattle were used for heavy labor and heavy work. Habakkuk is describing what life could look like on a scorched earth after Babylon is done. And he says, we may not recover from this or be able to start over again. What would you do if your portfolio went up in smoke? If your hard-earned retirement savings was just gone in a couple of days, if the stock market went to zero, what would you do if you lost your job? If the social safety net fails, what would you do if one of your loved ones died of a heart attack? Think about your life. What is the worst possible thing that you can imagine? What if that came true? The worst possible thing you could imagine. What then? Uh, Maybe you are familiar with Rick and Kay Warren. Uh, Rick Warren, a pastor of Saddleback Church out in Southern California, a mega church, a very influential pastor. Rick Warren has written written Purpose Driven Life, 40 Days of Prayer, a whole bunch of different books. Uh, Well, Rick and Kay Warren, back in 2013, their 27-year-old son, Matthew, uh, took his own life. He had battled with mental illness for years, and on what would have been Matthew's 27th birthday, Kay made some personal reflections on her blog site. She said, on July 18th, 1985, I gave birth to our beloved gift of God. 
Matthew David Warren. Holding him in my arms that morning, I had no idea how dark the journey would get for him and for all those who love him. All I knew that bright morning that I was madly in love with him and could see nothing ahead but a mother's dreams of a good life for her son. A few months before Matthew was born, I was sick in bed on Easter Sunday, 1985. Full of fear for my unborn child, I painfully reached for my Bible and it fell open to Habakkuk 3.17 through 19. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. This was a word of the Lord to me, and I determined that even if my worst nightmare came true, if my baby died, or if I never walked again, that I would trust in God as my Savior, and I would rejoice in him as sovereign Lord. And she says, Matthew David Warren was born, and everything seemed fine. But by his first birthday, we began to wonder. And by his second and third birthdays, we knew he wasn't like his older brother and sister. When he took his life last year after battling so hard for so many decades, a friend sent me Habakkuk 3.17 through 19 in a sympathy card. She had no idea that this passage was incredibly significant to me, but it was a fitting book in to his life. Because I had feared for years that he would take his life, it became his greatest pursuit and my deepest anguish. I had to come to the point in which I said, as I had 27 years earlier, even if my worst nightmare comes true and he takes his own life, even if that happens, I will rejoice in God my Savior and be joyful. So today on his 29th birthday, through weeping, I shouted to the universe, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Yes, my heart remains wounded and battered, but my faith is steady. Let me ask you, could you say yes, Lord, if the worst possible thing happened? You know, I'd like to believe that I would be able to say yes, Lord, but I've never been tested in that way. You see, Habakkuk teaches us that it's possible to dwell on a scorched earth with joy. When your life goes up in ashes, somehow paradoxically you can still have joy. But Pastor Jeff, that that doesn't make sense. How can we rejoice in our circumstances while lamenting at the same time? Well, apparently joy isn't just something random that happens to us because of favorable circumstances, but it is at least in part volitional. A joy is a decision that we make. We choose to exercise faith. We choose to have joy in the promises of God even when life hasn't turned out the way we would like it to turn out. At some point, we have to do what John Piper says. He says, occasionally weep over the life that you hoped you would have. Grieve the loss. Feel the pain. And he says, but then at some point you have to get up, you have to wash your face, and you have to trust God, and you have to embrace the life that he's given you. In other words, like Habakkuk teaches us, we have to pull faith out of the toolbox, so to speak, and we have to put our faith to work. The just shall live by faith in the promises of God, even when life doesn't turn out for them the way they would like it to turn out. Habakkuk shows us that it is possible for the people of God to dwell on a scorched earth with joy. With joy. Why? Because of who God is and because of all of his precious promises. Habakkuk shows us that joy and lament, paradoxically, are not incompatible, that they can fit together. When the world is scorched all around us, This is when we have to do what? We have to put on our big boy pants and our big girl pants and we have to choose volitionally to have faith, to have trust, and to say, I'm going to find joy during this time in the person of God. Uh, To trust in God when there's nothing but smoldering ashes in our lives is an act of volition. Habakkuk chooses trust. Habakkuk chooses joy. Do you see that? He says what? Yet I will quietly wait. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. At some level, those are choices that we make. 
And God promises us stability during those difficult and uncertain times. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. If we know the Lord, if the Lord is our Savior, we can still have feet to tread on the heights, the difficult places, in the most challenging moments of life. Because of God's promises, it is possible to dwell on a scorched earth with joy. It's possible to go through a difficult season in life, a difficult life with joy, but it's a decision that we have to make. And notice with me that nothing about Habakkuk's circumstances have changed. Uh, Has anything changed from the beginning of the book? No, the book began with a question mark, but it ends with an exclamation point. It began with a sense of fear and frustration, and it ends with faith. Nothing at all has changed in Habakkuk's circumstances, but Habakkuk has changed. He's changed because God has changed him through a process of prayer. Uh, Some of you right now are perplexed at life. Some of you are living a scorched reality of your own. Maybe your children, your marriage, your job, uh, the loss of a loved one. But even if your circumstances never change, you can choose faith because the Lord is your Savior. And let me ask you something. If this type of faith was possible for Habakkuk, How much more is it possible for us today? For the followers of Jesus, Habakkuk remembered the Exodus, which was the salvation story, the gospel as he knew it. But we have a much more glorious vantage point than Habakkuk. Uh, Habakkuk saw God's work in part from a small hill outside of Jerusalem. But we see, if you will, God's work from a panoramic viewpoint on the mountaintops of Colorado where we can see beginning, middle, and end what God has done, what he is doing in Jesus. We know how the story ends. We know Jesus by name. We know his work. His precious promise is there in much sharper focus for all of us. And because of this, it is possible for us to choose to dwell on a scorched earth with joy, to go through difficult circumstances of life with joy. Father, a glorious Father, thank you for the perspective that you give us through your servant Habakkuk. Thank you for letting us see behind the veil with Habakkuk And thank you, Lord, for tearing the veil away through our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, as we wait on you in faith, give us grace when life doesn't turn out for us the way we want it to, when we don't get the answer that we want. And as we seek your face, even though our circumstances may not change, God, would you change us on the inside like you did with Habakkuk? Show us that faith and joy are choices that we make. And even when everything is scorched around us, we can live with joy. God, these are hard lessons, easy to talk about, but hard to learn. So God, in each and every circumstance that is represented in this room today, please give us the help of the Holy Spirit that we might say as Habakkuk said, God the Lord is my strength and he makes my feet like the deer's. God, we love you and we thank you for all that you have promised. And we look forward to its fulfillment. In the name of Jesus, amen.